The last page has been turned on my most recent read. Condensation is clinging to the side of my reusable water bottle. It's way too hot to faff with making anything else. And I am ready to tell you all about the book I've just finished. So here I am, no spoilers, opinion filled and ready to roll. All of which means it's time for the latest episode of Being Bookish. I'm your host, Ray, self-confessed bookworm, introvert, hermit, long-term depression sufferer, and ex-coffee addict. Join me on my journey through my ever-growing to-be-read pile and enjoy the latest of my 100% spoiler-free book reviews. Where has the time gone? We're already... Three weeks into August, my holiday is getting closer and closer and I am actually counting down the days. Though another week has passed, it's actually been a really quiet one. I have done some reading, done a bit of future planning, which I'll probably tell you about closer to the time. And I have been sitting on top of a fan trying to get just a little bit of cool air because as much as I love the summer, I am not built for this heat. Anyway... This week, I am going back to my 21st year, when Point Horror was still a thing, and talking about a trilogy of books that I haven't read since 1999, as is proved by the bus ticket I found shoved inside the cover of one of these paperbacks. So light a few candles, or perhaps just switch on that reading lamp, because a bit of atmosphere is always a wonderful accompaniment to a reading session. Get yourself a fresh cup of something hot or a glass of something chilled, probably more appropriate in this weather. And let's get started. It's been a while since I have covered anything that is truly YA, or at least old style YA, from before the days of Harry Potter and Twilight. The late 80s and early 90s were the era of Sweet Valley High, Sweet Dreams Romance, and of course, point horror, with the foil text in sharp writing and the covers that tried to look scary. It was the era of books like Easy Freedom and Easy Connections, which I have already talked about, and before shows like Buffy that were created with this audience in mind. This week I am talking about a trilogy by author L.J. Smith, who is probably best known by most for the original Vampire Diaries series that inspired the CW show. There's a whole legal story behind that one, which I won't go into because it's very big money versus small author and very messy. Anyway, I'm not talking The Vampire Diaries today. I'm going to be talking about a trilogy that was released a few years later, The Forbidden Game. When When Jenny Jenny buys a game for her boyfriend, Tom, Tom, she she finds finds herself herself inexplicably drawn to the guy behind behind the the counter. counter. There is something mysteriously alluring about Julian's pale eyes and bleached blonde hair, and when he places the game into her hands, she knows that their connection is something deeper. But as Jenny and her six friends begin to play the game at Tom's birthday celebration, a night of friends and fun quickly turns into a night of terror and obsessive love. Because the game isn't just a game, it's the seven friends' new reality where Julian reigns as the Prince of Shadows. One by one, the friends must confront their phobias to win the game. To lose the game is to lose their lives, and that is only the beginning. There's something to be said for reading a book after 23 years. Not only does it open your eyes to the fact that there were some huge issues with the writing, which I will get to, but it also opens your eyes to the sort of fiction that started the whole gaslighting, obsessive, possessive boyfriend thing that we are so familiar with from books like Twilight. Jenny is 16. She comes from a relatively wealthy background. She's popular, pretty, and seemingly has everything she could ever want, including a handsome, intelligent, adoring boyfriend. So of course, she wants everything to be perfect. Obviously, as these books are aimed at young teens, the publishers wouldn't want to be seen as condoning all outrages with alcohol and drugs, especially in the 90s when this book was written. So the story begins with Jenny going shopping for the perfect party game to entertain a very select group of friends at Tom's 17th birthday party. The game has to be just right. Perfect. Just like Tom. 
though there are some issues in that relationship that really could do with being looked at. And it's this that leads her to the hole in the wall store. You'll later realise how accurate that description is, called More Games. Jenny has zero reason to be suspicious of this store or the enigmatic blue-eyed boy who works there. But she gets a vibe that something isn't quite right. Doesn't matter though, she ends up buying a game in a white box. A game that turns out to be very different. From the beginning, it's obvious that there's something different about Julian. The boy in the shop, Jenny notices right off that he's different. He's beautiful and she struggles to focus when he looks at her. But no one would ever believe that that momentary encounter could trigger the disaster that her life and the lives of her friends is going to become. He's enigmatic, beautiful and the embodiment of temptation, though Jenny does her utmost to ignore it. And it seems like he's kind of taunting her a little bit. Mystery, he He said. said. His His voice voice caught Jenny Jenny halfway across across the room. room. She hesitated in spite of herself. herself. What on earth did he mean? Danger, seduction, fear. Jenny turned back to face him, staring. There was something almost mesmerising about his voice. It was full of elemental music, like water running over rock. Secrets revealed, desires unveiled. He smiled at her and pronounced the last word distinctly. Temptation. What are you talking about? she said tensed to hit him or run if he took one step toward her. He didn't. His eyes were as innocently blue as Nordic fjords. The game, of course. That's what you want, isn't it? Something very special. Despite her misgivings, when Jenny gets home and her trusting parents leave her the house for the night, the game begins. Of course, Jenny isn't the only one involved. We have Audrey, the daughter of diplomats who has lived all over the world, and though she doesn't mean to, sometimes shoves that experience in her friends' faces. Then there is Zach. He is a keen artist and photographer, and Jenny's cousin, much quieter than the others, only speaking when he has something to say. Dee is athletic. She is Romanian, and her arbor proves invaluable to the teenagers as the story continues. Her mother is a computer programmer and Dee occasionally feels inadequate next to her, despite her own achievements. Michael is the nice guy. He's got a number of neuroses thanks to multiple issues in his younger years, but he's friendly, funny and dating Audrey somehow. And then there's Summer. She's the girl that I think of as the bouncy, happy blonde. She knows she's not the brightest cliche much but she is loyal fun to be around and the person you can't help but like outnumbered by her friends when it comes to playing the game that she purchased things become all too real as they are transported into the house that they built out of paper and it's a race to the finish for jenny as she has to save all her friends from their worst nightmares but julian wasn't what he seemed he is no byronic cyberpunk boy from a game store He's a shadow man from the shadow world, and for years he's been watching Jenny and waiting for the right time to collect his reward. Do you know the story of Hades? What? She didn't like this mercurial jumping from subject to subject. Hades, he said encouragingly like someone helping her cram for a final. Greek god of the underworld, ruler there. He lived in the world of shadows and he was lonely. And then one day he looked up to the earth's surface and saw Persephone, picking wildflowers, I think, laughing. He fell in love with her on the spot. He wanted to make her his queen, but he knew perfectly well she wouldn't go with him willingly. So... Julian is a boy by the standards of his people, much younger than the other shadow men, and his patience has worn thin. He has been waiting for Jenny for a long time. Since he saw her when she was just six, which seems a little bit creepy to me. And now he believes he has been waiting long enough, but he's giving her a chance. Win the game, get all her friends back, and she can leave. The stakes are high and Jenny is determined that whatever happens, she is going to win, no matter what. I'm going to put my hands up. I know that I always say no spoilers, But as this book is just the first part of a trilogy that, if it were written and released now, would probably be just one novel, 
it's pretty hard to stick to the no spoiler rule until the ending, of course, which I am not going to reveal. I know that it's now published as an omnibus and there are rumours that a fourth book called Rematch will be coming in the near future. However, as this is from the same author who has been promising book 10 in the Night World series since 1999, I'm not going to get my hopes up and I'm certainly not going to hold my breath. Jenny is a bit of a Miss Perfect. She got her friends into this situation and Julian has made it incredibly clear that they are here because she is. So she is determined to get them out of it. She helps each of her friends battle their worst fears, ranging from alien abduction to dark elves in the Black Forest. But then a messy room is their undoing and Summer is lost. Poor, happy Summer, who never hurt anyone, is a victim of her own nightmare. And the guilt that the teenagers feel is palpable, but they have to carry on or they will never get out of this paper house alive. But Julian has offered her a boon, a way to free one of her friends without any problems, a riddle that she has to solve. I am just two and two, I am hot, I am cold. I'm the parent of numbers that cannot be told. I'm a gift beyond measure, a matter of course, and I'm yielded with pleasure when taken by force. Even though I'd read this before, this time, that clue took me quite a while to resolve and the last phrase really had me wincing but then I think that may be 2022 brain talking not stupid naive 1995 brain. The first time I read this I can remember thinking tall blonde desperately in love (sighs) swoon. What sort of programming did I go through that I thought Julian was a romantic hero? Seriously, he's manipulative and so dangerous, blindly obsessive and doesn't care who gets hurt as long as he gets his prize. The funny thing is that in the first book, the scene that gave me the worst shudders was when Jenny discovered her cousin Zach in his nightmare. She leaned against him, letting him support her weight, feeling secure, cared for, safe. When he kissed the back of her neck, it was so tenderly it didn't disturb the safe feeling. Zach was nice. She loved him. She was happy to know he loved her. When he kissed her again, an unexpected tremor ran through her. Now, she wasn't supposed to feel like that, not with Zach. He shouldn't. He really shouldn't. Of course, it turns out that this Zach is actually Julian and he's taking advantage of her vulnerability a theme that runs throughout all three books. Jenny's own nightmare is not just a fear, but a memory of the first time she saw Julian and the other shadow men in her grandfather's basement. She was a child who let curiosity get the better of her and she opened a door that should never have been there and witnessed what her grandfather had done, trapping shadow men and using their power. He was an obsessive and unusual man, a sorcerer, And in the end, he traded his life for Jenny's. This memory is one she blocked out, but Julian forces it to resurface, as this is the moment that he fell in love with her. So, at the end of the first part, does good triumph over evil? To an extent. But Jenny agrees to bond with Julian in order to save her friends. She is willing to sacrifice herself. And he appears satisfied with this, almost gleeful that he has won the prize he wants, like a kid at a theme park desperate to win a unicorn. She accepts his ring and agrees to remain with him. But then when he is lulled into a false sense of security, she pushes him away with such force that he is trapped in the game house as the rest escape. The moment they are all free, Jenny pulls the ring from her finger and throws it into the house. They probably should have set fire to it, really, because no sooner have they dismantled it and pushed it back into the white box it came in. It's stolen. The second and third parts of the trilogy, called The Chase and The Kill, follow a similar vein. But this time, there is no house to build. They are playing out in the real world, where the monsters and shadows are feeling incredibly vengeful, and Julian still wants Jenny. In my view, the second book, The Chase, is really filler, with the realisation that Julian has escaped the prison that they created for him in the paper house, 
The remaining teens put a brave face on things and join the search for Summer, despite knowing she is gone and how it happened. But seriously, who would believe? Oh, we built a paper house and a shadow man stole her and killed her in a messy room. No one would believe that. Julian is furious with Jenny and this comes out in the way that he is very vindictive. He is like one of those children that isn't getting their own way. And when she clearly tells him that she's not interested, she doesn't want him despite the fact that she was wearing his ring. He goes about his revenge in such a way that she is going to suffer, taking her friends to the shadow world one by one and trapping them there. Admittedly, he does give her clues, but she still has to carry on knowing that this is all her fault. Indirectly, because it's not her fault that a shadow man fell in love with her. However, when she promised herself to him, it's as though she didn't realise the serious consequences. It's kind of like a teenager getting married and then wandering off because it's like, oh, it didn't mean anything. This one did. She promised her life to him and he's going to live forever. So he's going to make her pay for it. Tom's behaviour in the book annoyed me so much. Jenny is devastated. She's doing her best to hold things together. She lost her friend. The relationships with her other friends have changed because of everything that happened. There have been some mysterious disappearances and deaths in the area. And she knows that they are the result of her own actions. And Tom is just giving her the cold shoulder. He is determined he's going to beat Julian for Jenny because he knows what's going on, but he is distancing himself from her. And there is a moment where he says that he is doing all of this to protect her, even though she's not his anymore. It's as though he's gone, right, Julian won her, so he's her, she's his now, and I'm just going to do this because I'm still in love with her. But he treats her like rubbish. And that really frustrated me. As I've said, the teens disappear one by one. Poor Michael even disappears down the toilet in the bathroom of the apartment that his parents have. And he's been terrified all along. He's, as much as I like his character, sometimes his babyish whining really got on my nerves. But I think that's the adult in me talking. As a child, I'd have probably understood, or even as a young adult, I would have probably understood his fears far more and sympathised with the, I'm going to be, I'm going to be the next one. It's me next. It's me next. Because the only other person left was Jenny. But no, he frustrates me quite a lot. They're all replaced with the little paper dolls that they drew for the first game. There are certain differences made to their imagery, to the faces that they drew on these paper dolls that are distinctly Julian. And she knows that it's him. There's also a very creepy scene early on in the book where they've gone to see Summer's family. And there's a little girl there who is reciting all the better to eat you with from Red Riding Hood and she has this expression on her face that is very clearly not that of a little girl and that bit is really creepy it's very sinister and Jenny knows that it's Julian even though he's not blatantly there the very end of the book as I said it's a filler it's kind of the way that they go right well we had this specific ending in mind and we need to get there, so we're going to do this. They use a photograph that Zach took, a black and white photograph of their school cafeteria. And when Jenny realises that this is where all her friends are being kept, apart from Summer, who sadly didn't make it past the end of the first book, she goes into the photograph and does her best to rescue all her friends. Julian is obviously absolutely infuriated by this point, and he says, he tells her, you can leave if you can get out of this room, and then he sets it on fire. Jenny manages to escape with Dee, 
Audrey and Michael. However, Zach is frozen in place in fear. Tom goes back to rescue him and they both get stuck in the photo and the rest of the friends left to watch as the entire photo is destroyed by fire. It's kind of anticlimactic because at this point you already know there is a third book and you know that good will have to at some point triumph over evil. The third part is probably the creepiest, based as it is in a theme park after dark. I don't know about you, but that is creepy for me. When the lights are off, the place is empty apart from slithering shadow creatures, zombies and headless bodies. Jenny and her surviving friends, Audrey, Dee and Michael, have stolen money from their parents and travelled to Pennsylvania, the place where everything started all those years ago. This time, the game is searching for pirate treasure to buy passage to Treasure Island, where the game will hopefully finally be over. This one is not so much the end as in a on a massive scale. It is closure. As I've already said, the whole thing started with Jenny in her grandfather's basement opening a door and then later on finding out the truth about her grandfather being a sorcerer. In this book, her father is her grandfather is in the cruelest way possible being tormented by the shadow creatures. You know the fortune teller machine Zoltar in Big. Her grandfather has been made into one of these, almost as a mockery. And there are certain things about this machine that she finds familiar before she realises who it is. And when she's standing there and she's put her coin into the machine, a card comes out and all it says on it is help. And it's at that moment that she realises, this is my grandfather, I need to help him. But she's not quite sure what to do. As the adventure, I use the term loosely, progresses, she nearly drowns. Julian is so frustrated with her at this point, she won't give up on the idea of Tom as her perfect boyfriend. And she nearly drowns. She uses some runes that she discovered the meaning of in her grandfather's books and saved herself to a point. And then Julian brings her back to life because as much as he is frustrated with her and angry with her, his claim still stands. He still loves her. He wants her for himself. And if he can't have her, no one else will. But he's going to do his best to be the one that at the end she goes, yeah, I'm going to take him. Yeah, no, that's that's not going to work. I mean, that's just absurd, obsessive stalker behaviour. But it's revealing an element of his character that we weren't aware of before. He's been obsessive, he's been violent, he's been vicious, he's been cruel. But he has never at any point, apart from saying, I love you, and almost tricking her into kissing him, he hasn't shown her in any other way that he actually cares for her that he loves her and at the moment where she nearly drowns he actually proves to her I care for you of course where there is her grandfather she starts to get faith that maybe Summer is okay and when she reunites with Dee and Audrey and Michael after seeing her grandfather they discover Summer she is in her dress she is laid out on a table and though it's not easy for them to get to her she is saved and then you discover that Julian saved her for Jenny and he admits that he did it for her he didn't do it for anybody else he didn't do it for Summer he didn't do it because he felt any measure of guilt he did it because he wanted to prove to Jenny that he cared for her and then of course they get to the island Finally, they find their doubloons that they need to buy passage to the island and they find the boys. And here we have our final battle. Is good going to win? Is bad going to win? The fact that there is in motion a sequel to this book begs the question, what does happen at the end? 
Is it the closure that we actually wanted? Is it the closure we needed from the story? I'm not sure. Maybe we'll find out at some point with the next book, if it is ever released. It's just currently TBA. (laughs) So to be announced at some point in the near future. But then, as I said, I keep on holding out hope that um, Strange Fate, which is the 10th book in the Nightworld series, is going to be released. It has been promised for 23 years now. That's a long time to wait for a book. Before I get into what I thought of the books, you know that I like to make sure that my reviews are balanced. So what did other reviewers think? Though it's quite difficult because most of these people are going to be looking at it from a nostalgic reference. Lindsay is obviously reading with nostalgic glasses on. She even says as much, giving the book five stars. I read 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 this this in seventh seventh grade grade, in just just a few few days. days. I remember sneaking it into school and reading it during English class, feeling like such a nerd rebel. Now that I'm older, it kind of reminds me of Labyrinth with David Bowie. A chick and all her friends get swept into a deadly game because some hot evil magic guy has fallen in love with her and wants to make her his queen of shadows and will do anything to win her. Why that's such a problem is beyond me. Summary is kind of stupid, but the book is so good. This was actually a trilogy, but I got the omnibus edition with the three books in one, so I've always considered it one book. I've read it so much over the years that the binding is coming loose. After I finished this the first time, my tween self was like, this is the hottest thing I've ever read. Sigh. I was sad to finish. Even today, it brings about schoolgirl giddy feelings in me. However... Not everybody is going to feel the same, and Emma had conflicting views when it came to the trilogy, giving it just two stars. All right, here goes. I liked this book, but I also did not like it. I have so much to say. Coming into this book, I expected too much. My friends kept telling me how amazing this book is and how much I had to read it. I finally caved in and bought the book. So this book is kind of a bind-up of three books in one, all from the same story, just separated into three other books, The Hunter, The Chase, The Kill. As I was reading The Hunter, I was telling myself, oh, hey, this is pretty good. But when I got to The Chase, I was wondering when this book would end. When you tell yourself that, you know that the book really isn't a hit for you. When I read a book, I want a book that is so good it makes you want to read the book at night under the covers of your bed with a flashlight. As for the plot... I thought the idea of the book was really good, but how L.J. Smith executed the story was not very good. I did not like the writing, especially that it was in third person. As for the characters, I didn't like any of them except for Julian. That's it. Everyone else was whiny and annoying, especially Tom. He was the most annoying of all. The ending of the book was definitely not a hit. Although I didn't like it, it doesn't mean that whoever's reading this won't like it either. Everyone is different and has a different taste in books. So where do I fall when it comes to this series as they are old favourites or they were old favourites? Here's where I get into the nitty gritty. Did I like the book? I keep on saying book because my brain tells me this should be just one, not three separate books, but I appreciate that they are a product of their time in that during this era, they felt that shorter books, bite-sized stories were the best way to get people to buy. Not only that, they were £3.50 each at the time I purchased them, which is kind of shocking now when I think about how much I pay for my books. I've probably got a collection that's worth a good £10,000, which is quite sad. Well, actually, no, it's not sad. Why am I saying sad? It's not sad. I love my books. But the fact that I have over the years spent so much on them is kind of horrifying. That's a house deposit. I love these stories or this story for nostalgic reasons more than because it's high quality writing or a great story. However, it was a great use of mythology and I loved the introduction of the Nine Realms, which 
Marvel fans will probably be more familiar with because of Thor, you know, Asgard, Midgard, etc., etc. All of those are mentioned in this book. And it was the first time I'd encountered them because I never read the Thor comics when I was a child. It did feel perfect as a teen novel to a degree, talking storyline and plot, not writing. But it is probably too short, especially when compared to other novels that are written for the same audience in the modern age, namely books like Harry Potter and Twilight, because this book is probably the same length as the first Harry Potter book, when all smushed together and taking out the irrelevancies. It would have been better as a complete novel, which would have removed the necessity for constant recaps, exposition and the middle novel, The Chase. However much Jenny protested that she and Tom were perfect for each other, he was far too controlling. There's, she's 16, he's 17, and he's telling her what to wear and what is and isn't appropriate. When in the second book he says that he has no one to blame for losing her but himself, he's not wrong. However, at that point he is just ghosting her. He's ignoring her. He's following her around like a creepy little stalker but he is ignoring any of her attempts to contact him. There were certain elements of the writing that felt incredibly repetitive, and worse than that, limited vocabulary. There were moments in the book where it was a constant exchange of he said, she said, during conversations. There are other ways of expressing talking. Whispered, shouted, groaned, cried, asked, told, mentioned, expressed. You get my drift? The second book, as I've already mentioned multiple times and was mentioned in one of the reviews, felt pointless. It was filler. As though the author realised we needed to get to a certain point by the grand finale and this book was the only way to get there. When it really was unnecessary, that could have all been put into the first book. I like the differences in the many characters, but sometimes it felt as though they were stereotypes and many other people who read them will probably feel the same. There's the girl who inserts French and German into her sentences because she's travelled, the girl who does sports, the chubby boy who's a massive reader and a nerd, the arty boy who's quiet and intense, and the central character Jenny who is just too perfect. Will I Read More by L.J. Smith. I have actually read most of her other works at one point or another in time. There is one book I have read multiple times in the Night World series, but I'm not sure that I would purposely go out and buy something if she did release a new book, unless it was book 10 in the Night World series, and I could finally complete my set because unfinished sets really irritate me. It's the only reason I have... Or it's the only reason at any point I had all of the Twilight books is because I needed a complete set. There are multiple sets on my shelves I've never read the end of because I got bored with them, but I like having complete series. If you're looking for something like this or you loved this and want something else, then these are probably the direction to go. Young adult books like this don't really get published anymore. In fact, Point Horror, which was a scholastic imprint, was discontinued in 2014 after a brief resurgence. However, these books are still discoverable, and some of the authors, such as R.L. Stein, are still writing. You could also take a look at books by authors like Rachel Kane and Darren Shan, both of whom write books in a similar vein. Of course, if you want more L.J. Smith, there is the Unfinished Night World series, the first four books in the Vampire Diaries, the first three books in the Secret Circle series, and check out her website, which I will post a link to below, for a series of short stories she has posted there, self-published, many based in the worlds she has created. The summer is continuing. Shocker. And I have to be honest, the heat is starting to get to me just a little bit. I love the summer, don't get me wrong, I really do. It really boosts my vitamin D levels, but at the same time, having to keep the blinds closed so my living room doesn't get hotter than 29 degrees C while I'm working isn't great. Even better, 
while aircon is available in some offices, it's not everywhere. I have to say, though, that going into a supermarket is blissful. However, coming out again isn't quite so good. This month, I have read seven books so far, and I am partway through book eight, which is a net galley preview, and I am really enjoying it. It's a fantastic TJ Klune, but TJ Klune is great, and I will post a re- link to my review of The House in the Cerulean Sea, which I heartily and definitely recommend you read. I haven't purchased any books this week, which is probably a good thing, especially when I look at the pile of physical books on my poor, overwhelmed TBR shelves. The five books I have from NetGalley and the book tours I have signed up to for September are probably enough to keep me going. All that having been said, I am still looking for books to add to the ever-growing bookcase. So if you have any fiction recommendations you would like to hear me talk about or just think I'd like to read, send me an email at notbeforecoffeepodcast at gmail.com. Yes, I do still need to change it. Or DM me on Twitter or Instagram and I will be sure to check them out. We're just about to start the third week of August and now my break is only nine working days away. I cannot wait. I have booked that Cotswolds day trip that I really wanted to go on, cue geeking out on Agatha Raisin and taking lots of photos. I might also be meeting up with fellow podcaster Lorraine to enjoy Burton on the Water for a few hours, which will be great. More than that, I am looking forward to getting a few more books finished and possibly sleeping in a few times because I really do need a good night's sleep at some point. There are a few new releases this week, unlike last week, so let's take a look. All of these books will be released in the UK between the 15th and 19th of August. The Twist of a Knife is the latest instalment in the Hawthorne series by Anthony Horowitz. So if you love his books, which I personally do, it might be worth picking up the previous three and then getting stuck into this one. Everyone has heard the inspiring story of Dame Deborah James and her book, How to Live When You Could Be Dead, comes out this week. If you love Chris Carter novels, then the latest in his Robert Hunter series, Genesis, should be right up your alley. So head over and that comes out on the 18th. Thinking about going vegan but don't fancy living on lentils and tofu alone, this new cookery book by Ella Mills, How to Go Plant-Based, should give you some inspiration. We've sort of been talking fantasy horror this week and this novel by Sunny Dean, The Book Eaters, could be just what you're looking for. If you have little ones at home who love a bedtime story, then Tom Fletcher's new book, yep, the guy from McFly, There's a Bear in Your Book, could be the newest addition to your nighttime routine. Admittedly, there are quite a few new books out this week. We're getting close to Publisher Heaven Month, which is September, so releases are definitely picking up. If you want to find out more, why not subscribe to my newsletter? You can find the sign up on my website and in my Twitter bio. So how are things in the bookish household this week? I want sleep. I really want sleep. I think I'm going to blame all of this on the heat. It's been about 25 degrees C when I go to bed at night. I have a fan on all night and I'm still struggling. And then it, do- it doesn't help that at six o'clock in the morning, my upstairs neighbours decide this is the perfect time to vacuum our bedrooms. So that is kind of the struggling to get to sleep and then being woken up really early combination that nobody ever wants to get into. It's admittedly having a bit of a draining effect on my mental health. But at the same time, I don't think I'm alone in this. I think that Going to bed when it's really hot is very difficult for anybody and globally everyone's suffering. So unless you're in Iceland or Greenland where it's definitely very, very cold, I'm not sure if that's even more conducive to sleeping or not. I've been very irritable courtesy of the sleep, but also my sugar levels are through the roof. I've been drinking water like it's going out of fashion. So much water. I could drain a river dry, I have no doubt. And my GP... And I have discussed this, but he's not going to do anything for a few more weeks. So yay, 
26 points on my sugar levels every morning is a fantastic thing to look forward to. I also have been feeling the side effects of perimenopause, as many women of my age will be able to sympathise with. But that's another thing that has to wait until my sugar levels are sorted. So fingers crossed. However, a good thing did happen yesterday. Even though it is absolutely boiling and I can't even bear to move in the thinnest clothing, which is still sticking to my skin, I am going to be starting a new exercise program. Has anybody seen those really random videos on Facebook and Instagram reels where there's a woman or a man, normally a woman though, with this weird thing around her waist and a weighted ball that she is using like a hula hoop. I decided to invest in one of those because it looks like something I could read while doing. You know, I could read a book while I'm doing it and listen to some music and just get my jiggle on. Definitely a lot of jiggle. And it will be, I think it's going to be fun. Something I can do to music, something I can do while doing other things. Granted, I won't be able to wander around the house because I do have a couple of glass doors And I have a few glass cabinets and I don't think my kitchen's quite wide enough. Very, very long galley kitchen. Definitely not wide enough to swing anything around in. Definitely not a hula hoop. But I think it will be fun and hopefully I'll be able to see some progress in the coming weeks. And I might actually share it with you on Insta if you're interested. Well, that's it for this week. Thank you for listening. If you like what you hear, why not share it with your friends and family and please post a star rating on Good Pods, Spotify, Podchaser or Apple Podcasts. Wow, there's a lot of options there for you. You can follow me on Twitter at being underscore bookish and on Instagram at being bookish pod or you can check out my website where I post book reviews and every single episode of the podcast beingbookish.co.uk. Well, I've actually got a lot to do, (laughs) shocker, to get ready for next week and the next book is calling me. So until next time, this is me saying farewell. Farewell.